this time on the Plutopia podcast, Linda Castellani and Tim Powers join John in a discussion about legendary sci-fi author Philip K. Dick. Tim and Linda befriended Dick thanks to their Cal State professor, Willis McNelly. Linda became one of Dick's so-called dark-haired girls. So I wrote Phil a letter because I was in a class taught by a professor named Will McNelly. I was in his Chaucer class in the previous semester I was in his science fiction class. And one day he came to the Chaucer class with a letter from Phil saying, uh, some of you might know who Philip K. Dick is and some of you may not, but you were in my science fiction class, so maybe you'd be interested in this letter. And it was all about his time in Canada at a rehabilitation place called Ex Calais. And the story of how he ended up being in Canada was kind of interesting. But I knew nothing of Philip P. Dick. I just heard this letter. I was 21, quite young, and as you will see, quite naive. And I thought, oh, this man's so sad. He needs a friend. I'll write him a letter. Although I have come to wonder lately if I might not have been encouraged to do so by McNally. But that's a whole other train of thought. Um, so I wrote Phil a letter. My letter was dated uh, April 7th, 1972. And a couple of days later, McNally called me into his office and said, Phil wants you to pick him up at the airport on Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> Which totally freaked me out. Hey, welcome everybody to the latest episode of the Plutopia podcast. I'm John Lebkowski, and unfortunately, my co-host Scoop Sweeney couldn't make it today. His internet crashed, which is a, a sad thing to see. Uh, it leaves one feeling sad and desperate and wandering around with a vacant look. Anyway, today, today we're going to talk about author Philip K. Dick, uh, science fiction author. Uh, I probably don't have to say too much about him because he's... Uh, I, he's been a huge influence on science fiction, but he was, he wrote like mind bending stories that explored the nature of reality and perception. And he wrote about alternate realities and did at least one alternate history. Uh, uh, the man in the high castle, uh, he wrote about like big monopolistic corporations and authoritarian regimes. So very timely to read Philip Dick now. He wrote about drugs uh, and possibly used drugs a bit. Uh, he wrote about the nature of consciousness and he had his own mystical and metaphysical experiences that, that were reflected in his writing and his work, especially his later work. Um, and science fiction since, uh, since Philip Dick was writing uh, has really felt his influence. He was a big influence on the cyberpunk subgenre. Uh, our guests today are Linda Castellani and uh, author Tim Powers, who both had personal relationships with Philip Dick and with each other at the time. Uh, toward the, it was toward the end of his life in his last few years. Uh, Linda was one of <coughs> Philip Dick's dark haired girls, uh, which we'll get into and talk about. <clears throat> and Tim is an author of science fiction and fantasy whose books often include elements of the supernatural and paranormal. And his latest book is uh, My Brother's Keeper. Am I correct? That is your latest book. Yes. Excellent. Cool. So here we are to talk about Philip Dick. And uh, I guess the, the obvious first question is, how did both of you become acquainted with him? Well... Uh, Linda, you should probably take that. Uh, okay. Um, the short story, the short answer is that I wrote Phil a letter. The long answer is I wrote Phil a letter because I was in a class taught by a professor named Will McNally. I was in his Chaucer class in the previous semester I was in his science fiction class. And one day he came to the Chaucer class with a letter from Phil saying, uh, some of you might know who Philip K. Dick is and some of you may not, but you were in my science fiction class, so maybe you'd be interested in this letter. And it was all about his time in Canada at a rehabilitation place called Ex Calais. 
and the story of how he ended up being in Canada was kind of interesting. But I knew nothing of Philip K. Dick. I just heard this letter. I was 21, quite young, and as you will see, quite naive. And I thought, oh, this man's so sad. He needs a friend. I'll write him a letter. Although I have come to wonder lately if I might not have been encouraged to do so by McNally, but that's a whole nother train of thought. Um, so I wrote Phil a letter. My letter was dated uh, April 7th, 1972. And a couple of days later, McNally called me into his office and said, Phil wants you to pick him up at the airport on Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> which totally freaked me out. I don't know anybody who answers letters in person. Uh, so it turns out that other people had also been writing to Phil, whose life at that point had sort of fallen apart. He was essentially homeless, in addition to being in this rehab facility and trying to deal with his drug habits. Um, and so uh, some people had invited him to come down and stay with them. So I gathered everybody up, including Tim, and off we went to the airport to pick up Phil. So yep. you should take it from here, Powers. Uh, yeah, I knew the uh, two young ladies who had said, you can come stay with us. And just as he answered Linda's amiable letter with, pick me up at the airport Thursday, <laughs> uh, he answered their letter with yes i'll i'll, I'll move in directly <laughs> and he uh, he didn't ask you know uh is there a bedroom <laughs> um he simply said yeah i'm on the airplane and so i don't remember if it was linda or the two young ladies but somebody asked me hey we're going to the airport to pick up philip k dick you want to come along uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, I had read uh, one of his books at the time, Time Out of Joint, um, but mostly he was to me just a name uh, among science fiction writers like John Brunner, uh, Murray Leinster, a name I'd heard but had not much read which worked out well because I was able to meet him as just a guy. If I had read his books previously to before meeting him, I, I'd have been choked with awe. Um, but yeah, we went to the airport and he appeared at the disembarking gate wearing a jacket that was kind of too small for him. It was the trench coat. Oh, remember yeah. the trench coat? It was That's trench right. Coat. Yeah. And uh, carrying a Bible, a New World translation. That's the Jehovah Witness translation. He said he was carrying the Bible to mollify customs. And of course, he had his uh, luggage was uh, just sort of a box tied together with an extension cord. <laughs> And uh, he was not have portly and had this beard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big, beard. big gray beard, portly guy. And was he wearing anything under the trench coat? <laughs> no, no. Nobody okay. has ever asked that. <laughs> <laughs> and not having had any preconception of him from uh, ever having read his books, he looked kind of. Very cheery, <laughs> you know, very uh, good natured, but kind of desperate, which God knows he had every excuse to be. I mean, here he's moving to a place he's never been to uh, to move in with people he has no acquaintance with. Uh, and then we just got in the car and Linda was driving and. Um, Somehow, instead of driving straight to Fullerton, we stopped off at Norman Spinrad's house. This if is you... another science fiction writer you may be familiar with, John. Yeah, another yeah major science fiction writer who could only have been about 30 at the time, don't you think? 
Yes, young and and sort of on the ascendant and had been communicating with Phil, I learned later up in Canada. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was I was kind of dazzled to meet Spinrad because I had read Bug Jack Baron and several other of his books. But um all I remember is over the couch, Spinrad had a long bookshelf uh, with a lot of his own books on it. Um, but then we got back in the car and drove on to Fullerton, where we must have dropped him off with the two young ladies. Neither I've... one of us has memory of anything after meeting Spinrad for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, Tim, were you I, a published writer at this point? No, this was 72. No, definitely not. Okay. Okay. Uh, and how did you, how did the two of you know each other? <laughs> we had met at a thing called the Witchcraft and Sorcery Convention in Los Angeles, as I recall. Is that right, Linda? That's correct. Um, it, I know that sounds kind of weird, but... At that time, there were a lot of fun things to do, and you just sort of went, oh, yeah, that one sounds interesting. I'll, I'll bop over there and see what's up. And um, I must have already known Candy, because she's the one who introduced me to you. Yeah, yeah, and she was another student of McNelly's. And, and McNelly yeah, she... has sort of a central role in this whole story. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. She and I drove up there, and in spite of the name, in witchcraft and sorcery, it was simply a typical science fiction convention. Uh, I remember D David Gerald, A.E. Van Vogt, um, uh. E. Hoffman Price, and I was definitely a fanboy and ran around getting Van Vogt and Price to sign books of mine, ah. which, which I still have. The only um, thing I remember about that convention was meeting you and buying a little wind up Frankenstein for a quarter, which was a re which was like five dollars back then. Um, yeah. And it was called um, Blood Monster, but it was definitely Frankenstein. It was yeah. off brand Frankenstein. And that that's my entire recollection. But then um, very shortly, Phil decided that the accommodations at the apartment of the two young ladies was no good. It turned out they had only a couch for him to sleep on and they expected him to buy all the groceries. And it was kind of, everybody seemed to be going through some kind of tumultuous emotional crisis. Uh, they used to say that if anybody was in the bathroom for more than a few minutes, everybody else would kick open the door to make sure they weren't committing suicide. And um, then Phil spoke at another of Will McNelly's classes and said, my living conditions are intolerable. And luckily, a young man in that class had recently been divorced and had a spare bedroom at his apartment and told Phil after class, move in with me. I could use help with the rent. And this uh, was a guy named Joel Stein. And Phil said, again just okay right i'm moving whoever you are and uh and he moved in with joel stein and luckily that worked out well joel was a student amiable well-read uh uninclined to emotional crises and um at that point we all were kind of hanging out together as i recall no, I, I don't know. Somehow it was like we all ended up on Quartz Lane. Yeah. So um, I had lived down the street at the uh, Montclair Apartments when I first met Phil. In fact, the letter I wrote him has my Ruby Lane address. And then somehow Alice and I ended up moving to, to Quartz Lane. And it was like, as I've said to you before, it was like a bunch of loose peanuts in a shoebox and we somehow all ended up in the same corner. Yeah, uh, yeah. But you yeah. know, Quartz Lane was like the center, the center of the universe at that point. 
Yeah, uh, that, of course, Joel Stein's apartment was on Quartz Lane. And well, yeah, that's where Phil moved. Yes. So Phil's on Quartz, you're on Quartz, I'm on Quartz, Mary and Mary, Mary Lou are on Quartz. Yeah. Everybody's on Quartz Lane for some reason. Yeah. These uh, are all student apartments, and there's a, a, a wide variety of them. How we all ended up within a block of each other is is a, a mystery, but there we were. Yeah, it's a, it's a good point that right across the hall, which was about this wide, um, from Joel's front door was another apartment, which had proved to have three young ladies living in it, which everybody found exciting. <laughs> and uh, one of them was uh, Mary Wilson, who also had a long running relationship with Phil, uh, not romantic at all, fortunately for her. Right, I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was a real uh, interesting coincidence cluster there on Quartz Lane, just all these people who wound up at the same time living in the same place with in, in Phil's orbit. Yeah. With, with lasting consequences. Exactly. All of our lives changed at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Although I have to say my life changed and I think a couple of other of us have had this experience. My life changed when I went to the TikTok to pick up a copy of Mad Magazine and there weren't any. Oh, yeah. And I ended up twirling the wire rack of paperbacks and just sort of randomly picked one called All the Myriad Ways by Larry Niven. And I took it back to my apartment and read it in one sitting and went, oh, pretty cool stuff is science fiction, huh? And I was putting my schedule together for the next semester and I looked to see if there was a science fiction class. And there was, and I joined, and that's how I met McNally. He was teaching the class. So McNally was uh, a noted critic, and he often wrote forewords to anthologies and things like that. So he was pretty well connected in the science fiction world, which is why we had such great guest speakers come to class and how he connected with Phil. He had also gone to that con that Phil spoke at in Canada, and that's where he connected with Phil. I'm, I've only learned all of these things within the last few months. Um, <laughs> I, I ended up, um, Tim and I ended up taking a class at uh, San Francisco State, taught by a professor whose life work is the works of and life of Philip K. Dick. And the class was, what, 18 weeks long, twice a week? And in, right. in, in, and it was done chronologically, so that the people who um, were prominent at the time and the books that were prominent at the time were one week. The next week, we moved sort of along the timeline. And Tim and I were towards the end, actually. Uh, Tim was the last one speaking about uh, Phil's death, which um, I had not experienced um, any part of that story. But right at that point, it was my turn to talk. I had learned a lot about Phil that I didn't know before. Like he was living in San Rafael. His house had become um, a revolving door for people with who were essentially homeless and had drug habits. Um, there was a lot of drama, of course, going on because that's the way Phil's life was. You know, it was one crisis to the next. And uh, at that point, he had lost his home. I'm not quite sure how that happened. And that coincided with his being invited to Canada to give a talk at this con. And so he packed up everything he had in that cardboard box and went off to Canada. Right. Where, yeah, his... where he received our letters, yeah. <laughs> which brought him to Fullerton. Yeah. Um, yeah, his last days in Marin County, as you say, uh, his wife had left him and not wanting to live alone, he had made his place kind of an open house for anybody that needed a place to stay, which turned out to be runaways and drug addicts. And uh, it was his fourth wife, right? Uh, yeah, it yeah, because Tess was his fifth. You're right, yeah. yeah. 
and and he um, was and he was doing drugs himself, right? He at of that sort. point, yeah, was um, he, uh, especially during the '60s, he was doing a lot of amphetamines, um, and no doubt still was at that point. I mean, what incentive would there have been to stop? And um, all kind of conspiracy theories and uh, oh, scary, yeah. scary a, roommates. His house was broken into. This is this was a, a topic that would become um, that would be discussed ad infinitum over the years. The break in, um, in which somebody broke into his house and blew up his safe and took a bunch of stuff and Phil was convinced it was, was it the FBI or the CIA? I forget which but one. But this was, was, was this later? Did this happen later than? This than happened like just Fullerton? before he moved to Fullerton. Oh, it okay. was bef before he went to uh, Vancouver. Before it was while he was. Oh, okay. Right. So, and the break-in at his house really was the incentive that made him decide not to come home again from Vancouver. And the break-in itself, and I've seen some photos of it. Oh. Um, every window, and some of this is probably apocryphal, but according to the predominant story, every window in the house was busted in. There were heavy combat boot-style prints in the mud outside every window, along with stacks of heavy-duty uh, Ziploc plastic bags. Uh, every open container of food in his house was taken away. Uh, uh, so if he had, for example, two boxes of Cheerios on a shelf and one had been opened, that one would be missing. The the still closed one stayed, which is, is, is uh, basis for all kind of interesting theories. Yes. But, and, uh, and also, for some reason, I have the idea. I'm not sure where I got it, but I wrote it down in my journal that it had also something to do with grapes. Either they took grapes or left grapes. With what? Grapes. The fruit, grapes. Grapes. Grapes, yeah. <laughs> well, I like that. I, I, I don't... <laughs> I don't recall it, but sure, why not? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, and his car had been tampered with. Uh, he thought in order to prevent him from being able to leave the house on that day so that he should have been home when it happened. But he somehow coat hangered the car into working and got away. Anyway. Um, but he didn't drive to Canada. He flew, right? Right. And he just left the car behind in San Rafael, and that was that? I suppose so. I, I Yeah. Um, and he never actually did go back. He did get somebody there, landlady. His mother. His mother, right. To send him a bunch of his possessions, like the manuscript of Flow My Tears. Um but that that was until his mystical experience in 1974 the break-in was the center of all the orbits uh and it was not only cia or fbi but paramilitary groups in the hills uh <laughs> just inland and several of his crazy roommates may have been agents of god knows what sort of covert organization uh it really provided him with endless uh basis for speculation as later did the mystical experience it's fascinating to hear about i remember sitting around joel's living room late at night uh listening to all these terrifying stories because they all kind of implied uh, an ongoing connection I mean, the bad guys were totally capable of following Phil to Fullerton. And uh, he would spin these scary stories. And I'd think, who is right outside right now, having finally caught up with him? And he had just bought the Stones album, Sticky Fingers. And I still can't hear, like, Sister Morphine or Moonlit Mile without 
being right back there, hearing all these terrifying stories. It's funny how those particular songs work. I yeah. I was in a particular situation when I got that album too, and I have a lot of memories around it. Um, Linda, um, yeah. we should talk some about the, I guess his, I guess I should use the word obsession with you, but also you should mention uh, kind of the, in the context of the time was that the way men related to women back then was a little different from the way it is now, right? A lot different, yes. Yeah. Yeah. We were, you know, objects and um, pretty much free for the taking without being able to say much because at that time, who were you going to tell? I mean, I, I tried telling people about what was happening with Phil and people would say, oh, that can't be true. He's famous. <laughs> Which was so, really well, I just wondered at what point do you think this uh, this feeling that he had for you started? I mean, was it oh. right away when he got there, or oh, instantly? <clears throat> yes. Um, in yeah. fact, he wrote about it later uh, in a letter to someone, in which he talked about when he saw me at the airport. The quote is, "It was destiny in a miniskirt." That's right. That's right. <laughs> but the key was this. I was a dark haired girl and Phil had this obsession with dark haired girls. He spent his entire life searching for the dark haired girl, um, which we all learned later may or may not have been due to the fact that um, he had a twin sister who died six weeks after they were born. And the only thing he knew about her was that she had dark hair. And so somehow this ended up playing upon his psyche in such a way that first of all, she died of malnourishment. He was the one getting most of the food. So she sort of starved to death as a result of his thriving. Um, whether or not his mother was able to produce enough milk is another story. Um, this was also in, in the 20s when um, a lot less was not so much known, but practice as far as um, obstetrics was concerned. She had no access to solutions. Um, and that also coincided with the time I've only recently learned because of this class that um, Professor Gill taught that uh the style of the times was that you didn't pick up your baby if they were if they were crying and cuddle them or soothe them in any way you just let them cry which went against everything that phil's mother's um instinct would have told her to do pick up the babies take care of the babies but um his sister ended up dying jane so somehow the speculation is that that's what fueled the dark haired girl. And I think that McNally knew about this. I, of course, knew nothing. I, I had never even heard of Phil before. Um, I, I have come to believe that McNally sort of nudged me into Phil's orbit to in order to provide him with a dark haired girl. But that I fit the what is it lost lovely lonely and long dark haired girl meme that he was searching for so that's lost I, yeah lost lost is an important word also yeah. i think i think that theory is very plausible yeah so i i think that's where the obsession came from and i think mcnelly recognized it um and sort of said you know hey you know you should write a letter to this guy <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's where the obsession came from. Um, I wasn't the only one. After Phil died, I discovered um, the, ex the literary executor of his estate is a man named Paul Williams. Are you familiar with him? He was a publisher of Crawdad. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah, I was oh, a yeah. big, uh, yeah. big devotee of Paul Williams at the time and a Crawdaddy reader. Uh huh. Well, he's a great guy, and yeah. you know he had the. Uh, thankless task of trying to 
straighten out the literary arm of Phil's estate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he encountered was a manuscript that had been submitted to Phil's agent called, what was it, The Dark-Haired Girl, um, Jameis Kathy Linda Tessa. That's right. Um, and later it was subtitled, A Search for the Authentic Human Being, um, that he had submitted to his uh, publisher, or his agent, I don't know, um, which contained a lot of writings to and about us, um, dreams and things like that. And um, Paul contacted me, he actually came down to Orange County to hang out with me for a little while. Um, and asked if he had permission to use my real name. So, but I didn't know any of this, of course, at the time. I didn't know that, you know, I knew, I sort of knew that everything he wrote on his typewriter pretty much had a carbon copy, which included, you know, letters and manuscripts and everything. It was always a carbon copy. Um, and so I didn't know that a lot of that existed and or was in play as far as publishing was concerned. I know that there's, you know, biographies and also collected letters that I have heard my, some of my letters are in. People will say, hasn't this been published? And I'll go, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fielding scholar, I have no idea. So. Well, yeah. you, you are now. <laughs> We're making you into a fieldic scholar. Well, yeah, yeah. something, symbol maybe, I don't know. Icon. So I talk if, about, oh, go ahead, Tim. Well, I was just wondering if uh, the others like Jameis, for example, have ever, are still alive, have been tracked down. Um, did I tell you that one of the things we found out was her last name? Oh. Yeah, I'm not gonna say it just because I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if that's a probably good. true or B, if she's still alive, I don't, I don't wanna, venture down that road but right. it, one of the things that Gil uncovered we found out her last name uh, did you find out if she's still alive uh, no so what I was going to ask is uh, is how you discovered that Phil felt the way he did about you oh well let me tell you <laughs> uh so shortly after I met Phil he invited me to go have dinner with him and Harlan Ellison. And at that point, I was a huge Harlan Ellison fan. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> I got all fangirl about it. Yeah, I'll go have dinner with Harlan Ellison. That'll be great. And so uh, on the appointed evening, we all tripped off <laughs> to Hollywood and uh, went to Harlan's house, which is called or was called uh, Ellison Wonderland to, um, I forget who else was there, um, but I was driving a 1967 yellow Camaro named George. And it turns out that Harlan's car was the exact twin of mine. And he had one of the earliest personalized plates. This would have been early seventies. His personalized plate said HE on it, which is, you know, perfect. If you know anything about Harlan. <laughs> um, and we all tripped off down to a restaurant in Hollywood called Ting Ho's, where we discovered that other people would be joining us. And one of whom was Ed Bryant, another science fiction writer I'd never met before, but turned out to be a great guy. And Harlan had, was teaching a class in his home and he had had a contest in his class to see who would be able to come have dinner with Philip K. Dick. And he was very apologetic. Ed Bryant was bringing this person who had won. And he was very apologetic. He said, I'm so sorry, out of all the people in the class, the toad won. I'm like, the toad? Because yeah, I'm so sorry, but she's a toad. Well, Ed Bryant walks in with this young woman and Phil said, Harlan? Where's the toad? I don't see a toad. Do you see a toad? And he kept talking along those lines, which gives you an idea of how he likes to push buttons, right? Where's the toad, Harlan? I don't see the toad. Um, so we had dinner and while we were eating, Phil handed me an envelope, a very thick envelope 
and you know then turned back to the group sitting there and continued eating and i'm like what do i do with this you know do i stop now and and read it what you know what is this about and i decided to read it then and there and it was a letter four pages single space typewritten of course um i'm you know with the carbon copy uh in, in undoubtedly a carbon copy and uh it went on and on about how wonderful i am i mean things that were said about me that i'd never heard before and would never hear again um that ended with p.s i'm deeply in love with you will you marry me so here i am sitting at this table in hollywood with harlan ellison you know, and Phil Dick and Ed Bryant and the Toad and who I can't remember who else going, I need to get out of here. I do not know how to respond to this, this proposal from a man I've known less than two weeks. You know, who, who responded in person to the letter I'd written him. Things are getting really uncomfortable at this point. So that's how I found out sort of the beginning of the depth of his obsession. Did you just get up and walk out? No, I stayed. I just, I, you know, I hung on to my decorum and acted like everything was fine. Wow. I acted as if, as they say. So then how did that, how did that play out going forward? Well, first of all, I didn't take it seriously. I mean, how ridiculous was that idea? Oh, sure, I'll marry you. Let's go to, you know, stop at the Justice of the Peace on the way home from the restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Get this thing underway. Um, it just made me feel very uncomfortable. And it was followed by many other letters of its kind. Um, but it didn't, it didn't last long. Um, the women that Phil quote unquote loves are in for a roller coaster of a ride. Um, women like Mary that he was friends with had a completely different experience than I did. Her relationship with Phil was wonderful, but um, an incident happened that made me have to stay away from Phil because I was no longer safe. And the way I sort of summarized it when I was going over my notes with Tim when we were doing this talk, or it was a talk on the well, on in Inkwell, and it sort of summed up in three sentences. Phil beat me up, everybody went to the movies, and I could no longer be part of the gang. So that sort of summed everything up. Um, well. Yeah, well, go on, do, do, do jump in here. Well, at that point, roughly, I may be jumping the gun a little. Uh, he, he, uh, I'm skipping over maybe where he met Tess. Yes, um, so he met Tess after I had to put distance between us. And you and I started going out uh sometime i guess after he had met tess yes because what happened was he sent us to the movies to see a clockwork orange right i think that's where everything started and as a result um he and i kind of drifted apart from roughly 73 through uh until a party he gave in 75 when his marriage with tess had begun to implode. Yeah, Tess, his marriage to Tess was another one of those impulsive. He met her at a party and they got married. Essentially. Yeah, that was a weird, uh, in fact, well, that was a big step. Yeah, yeah. and uh, let's probably speak um, discreetly about this since we don't know who might be watching this later. Right, um, I would say what would I say? Uh, <laughs> yeah, he met Tess in, um, I, I could look it up, it's right here, but um, uh, late 72? Uh, Probably, yeah, maybe fall of 72? It would have, in July, he and I went to uh, Westercon, 
in Long Beach, a science fiction convention. And at that convention, he met Ginger Smith, who was a longtime science fiction fan, very active in fandom. And through her, through a party she gave uh, some months later, he met Tess. And uh, sort of like your experience, as soon as he met her, uh, all intermediary steps are dispensed with. Just suddenly, he's in love, going to marry her. Um, I, there are some colorful stories there. but yeah. um, And she has had dark hair. And what? Dark hair. Dark hair. Yeah, she had dark hair. I like the way I lean forward to hear better. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, re I remember reading about their relationship, though, and that Rolling Stone article talked about the volatility of their relationship, as I recall. The, the, whoever wrote that article was there Paul when they Williams were having a big fight. Oh, was it Paul? Okay. And I think, that, uh, I, I think that he included something about, I remember something about her telling him that she was going to pound him or something like that. It was tumultuous, I think, uh, yeah. but um, of course, the, the <laughs> probably the main consequence of uh, his marriage to Tess was their son Christopher, um, who I think may may be living somewhere or not far from me here in San Bernardino these days, um, but. Uh, yeah, the marriage with Tess also imploded. And uh, so his last, that would have been 76. So his last like six years, he was single again. And, and fortunately, we noted at the time, he seemed to have learned not to marry <laughs> the girls. Um he had some real peculiar girlfriends during the last six years about one of whom he said we were saying how odd she was and he said yeah she almost he says oh my god my name is legion um of course reference to the uh possessed person in i think uh matthew's gospel um but at least, at least, yeah, he had learned not to um, marry the women he fell in love with. So uh, there was also the one story that you told me before, Linda, about uh, uh, he, that he tried to divert your car into oncoming traffic. Well, okay. Um, so one of the things about Phil's emotional state was that he was very... I would say passionate um, about just about everything. It, you know, nothing was minor, nothing was too trivial to have a huge reaction to. Um, and one of the things that had happened uh, very, very quickly, this, my relationship with Phil did not last long. The correspondence with him started in 72 and ended in 75. But I would say that three quarters of that took place after I was keeping my distance. So um, after dinner with Harlan um, and before the event that you're talking about, there'd been another event in which I had seen him fly into a jealous rage because I had a date with Norman Spinrad. Um, and I've also gotten some insight into his reaction about that, Tim. Um, I did not know that uh, they had sort of a mentor-mentee relationship uh -huh. and that might have triggered some of the reaction that he had, but his reaction was so over the top that I thought he was going to, to kill me at that point. Um, and, and I hadn't even moved Quartz Lane yet. I was still living on Ruby at that point. Um, and, and I know this only because it was in my journal and I can, you know, I have the, the chronological details. I wrote him the letter on April 7th. My journal entry about this event was April 28th. 
So it, it was not very long after we met the first time that I saw his rage. Um, so we still hung out for a little bit in the interim. And one night we went to see Fiddler on the Roof at the time that it was big in theaters. And, and on the way home, I was quite subdued because I was very, um, I know, taken by the story. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And so we didn't do a lot of talking on the way. And as we got closer to our apartments, I remembered that I needed to get gas. So I stopped at the gas station on the corner in our neighborhood. And as I drove into the gas station, I realized that a friend of mine was working there that night, a fellow student, um, with whom I had plans later in the week. And because I had seen his reaction when I had a date with Norman Spinrad, I thought, oh no, what am I going to do? I need to head this off at the pass. So I drove into the gas station at that time in the, in the olden days, you drove into a gas station, a little bell rang and an attendant would come out, ask you what you wanted. He'd start putting gas in your car, wash your windshield, check your oil, things like that. And I just had this picture of this fellow coming to the, to the car, I'd roll down my window and he would think Phil was my father and might somehow start talking about, you know, how I knew him or the plans that we had or whatever. And I thought, okay, I'm gonna head this off and got out of the car instead to talk to him, to step away. And when I did that, Phil had one of his reactions. And in this case, it was, it was tightly controlled rage expressed as waves of ice. And, and while I was talking to my friend, he very slowly and deliberately got out of my car, slowly and deliberately closed the door, slowly and deliberately walked to the TikTok, the local, our little market there right next to the gas station. And in the same mode of slow and deliberate came back with a quart of milk. So we finished the transaction with the car and now he's over there seething, you know, I know it. And I'm, I'm not going to ask him what's wrong. <laughs> I know better than to ask questions. I don't want to hear the answer to um, get back in the car, start driving down the street. And suddenly he grabbed the steering wheel and turned us into the path of the oncoming traffic where, you know, I'm, I'm fighting with him for control of the steering wheel and we're veering back and forth. And I can't even remember what kind of track traffic was coming at us or what they did, but I finally regained control of the car and pulled over to the side of the road and said, get out. And he turned to me um, and with one hand grabbed me by the windpipe and with the other hand started punching me in the face. And I finally got him out of my car and I drove off and I said, okay, Phil Dick, that's it for you. <laughs> so that was it. I, I think uh, we're kind of, we're getting close to the end. And I, I think it's probably important to say that uh, not everybody saw this side of Philip Dick. Only and, the woman he was in love with. And he was yeah. a real different person yeah. in most cases, right? Or in most situations. But can Tim, I, Tim, well, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say, can I mention an anecdote that will sort of leaven the, you know, the 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 atmosphere following sure. that story? I just wanted to relay an anecdote about another thing that happened with Phil, which I recalled because Tim was talking about um, how Phil became paranoid after the break in and, you know, talked about you never <laughs> outside. Well, I know where you're going. And, and, um, and, you know, he would look out the window and point out the narcs and the cars parked uh, along the street. So um, we were all sort of hyped to this. And one day, I was living, as I mentioned, down the street, um, and our apartment was being fumigated. And we had been told to vacate the apartment between these hours and to remove all the drawers 
and like the built-ins, the cabinets and, and stuff like that. I had a couple of built-ins in my room. I pulled out the drawers there. But when I came home at the appointed time, I discovered that they had also pulled out the drawers of my dresser. And front and center on my bed was the drawer containing my stash. Yes. And I freaked out and I went, I'm busted. You know, uh, <laughs> you know. Wait, you were smoking marijuana? I'm horrified. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, imagine that in the 60s and 70s, boy. Mm. So there it was. And I'm sort of freaking out going, is this like, a warning just to let you know we know you know and we'll call the police later i had no idea what was in store for me and for some reason i called phil do not ask me why i can't okay. imagine why i called phil of all people and phil immediately goes into crisis mode he you know he loves a crisis um and he comes up with a plan here's what we're gonna do he says, we're going to get together a whole bunch of people and everybody's going to go and go to a different Carl's Jr. and get food to go and bring it back. And then we're going to have all these different Carl's Jr. bags and we're going to put a little bit of the pot in each of the bags. And then we're all going to fan out all over Orange <laughs> County and put different bags in different dumpsters <laughs> all over the county. And I thought, I thought it was hilarious, but he was dead serious. Did you do that? No. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it gives you an idea of sort of the swing between the guy who wants to kill you and the guy who, you know, has this fantas fantastic plan about how to avoid getting busted. And Tim, you had a lot of, um, you spent a lot of time with, with, Phil and other people kind of just hanging out, right? Well, yeah, there was a whole bunch of people like KW and Blaylock and yeah. all of whom would later become science fiction writers somehow, which had nothing to do with Phil. Well, it, uh, in each of our cases, it had a bit. Um, yeah, we all, I of course met him, as I've said, with the airport and everything uh, and Joel's apartment. Um, I introduced him to Blaylock and eventually K.W. Jeter. And all three of us had long wanted to be writers, specifically science fiction and fantasy. And all three of us already had lots of rejection slips and so forth. Um, he, he was instrumental in getting Jeter's book, Dr. Adder, published uh, by Bain Books. It's a very unpleasant book, actually. Um, but, uh, Phil wrote a very glowing, uh, you know, uh, blurb for it and, um, and Bain books. No, it wasn't Bain. It was Blue Jay, Blue Jay books. Uh, Jim Frankel published it. And, um, for Blaylock, he wrote a very nice blurb for Blaylock's first book. And for me, when my, um, would have been third book if it had ever been published um got rejected he wrote to his agent and said uh i think you should take powers on check out this book and his agent read the book and said we don't agree we don't see any value here <laughs> um though I, I some years later i did wind up with that agent so he did he did uh help each of us in some way but mostly we didn't discuss it with him. We never, for example, said, Phil, read this manuscript. Uh, Phil, you know, uh, give me advice. Um, I, I think we were kind of too shy because uh, we were just these bumbling wannabes and he was an established star. Uh, it just would have seemed presumptuous we swapped manuscripts around among ourselves and critiqued one another. But um, the only times the subject would come up with Phil would be when we'd say, oh, hell, Delray Books just rejected the thing I sent to them. And I remember he would say, it's just as well. There's too many books in the world already. <laughs> 
uh, were, were you, ahead. well, were you spending time with him when he got into that more interesting phase where he saw the pink light? And uh, yes. kind of... I was not, that was, um, between the time he and I sort of drifted apart in say 73 and when I reestablished contact with him uh, in 75. So no, I, I wasn't uh, present when it was happening live. And I, I think, I think very, pe very few people were. I think not just with me, but I think across a broad spectrum, when he married Tess, they did kind of isolate from the people they had that he had met after coming down to Fullerton. Uh, but anyway, no, I wasn't there. I, of course, I heard stories about it afterward, which were just as wide ranging and colorful as the uh, stories about the break in. Yeah, and of course it led, led him to, I guess it was incorporated into Vallis and some of the other things he wrote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He had all kinds of wonderful theories about it, uh, which Vallis kind of uh, touches on. Uh, sometimes he thought it was God who had spoken to him. Sometimes he thought it was his own self from an alternate dimension or the future. Very often he thought it was simply an acid flashback <laughs> and had no significance at all. Probably pretty likely, huh? I think it was God myself. I, mean, I if prefer I had to, to think so. It. Yeah, I prefer to think so. <laughs> so um, we just got a couple of minutes left, and I guess uh, it would be worthwhile to mention you were you were you, you had become friends with him again, and were were present when he died, or or around near the time he died. Yeah, he. Um... <clears throat> His uh, next door neighbors, uh, Mary Wilson called them up because she had not been able to get him on the phone. She said, could you go check on him? And they apparently had a key or the door was unlocked, but they went in and found him unconscious on his living room floor. Called paramedics, called Mary Wilson. She called me. It was a Thursday night, I know, because my wife and I always had a gathering of people on Thursday and Phil was always one of the people. And so I raced down to his apartment building, which was about two blocks south and arrived just as Mary Wilson and the paramedics arrived. And all of us went trooping up to his apartment and uh, they went in first, the paramedics, they had him spread out on the bed. They were doing things like, squeeze my hand. Philip, can you hear me? Can you squeeze my hand if you can hear me? Push your foot against my hand here. And asking questions about his medications and stuff. And I asked one of the paramedics, I said, you probably see a hundred of these a month. How do, what's your uh, unofficial prognosis? And he said, he, I, I, yeah, I see these all the time. He'll probably come through. And they wheeled him away on a gurney. And Mary went to the hospital with him. And for the next several days, people were visiting him in the hospital. And there were all, actually, there were all kind of uh, dramatic complications about who was allowed to visit him in the hospital and who was not. And at first he was expected to survive, but then he had a couple of subsequent strokes and did not. And then there was a colorful court hearing to decide who would, what, have control of the estate. Because he didn't have a will. Because he didn't have a will, which oh, I will... I'll yeah. remedy that. I'll remedy that, Linda. Yeah, I know. I keep saying this to Jenny. <laughs> Get a will. <laughs> <laughs> but, we've actually, uh, we've reached, we've reached the end of the hour. I can think of a lot more things to ask and to talk about, but we usually limit these to an hour. Maybe we could get back together sometime and talk some more. There's lots more. 
There's Excellent. a lot. There is a lot more. Well, let's do it again. Okay. Thank and you. Thanks so me. much for. Uh, oh well, thanks for joining me. And uh, um, I don't know. I was a huge Philip Dick fan, and it's always been fascinating to hear these stories. Um, I. Uh, Man, I think he was really complicated. <laughs> yeah, that's what a character. Yeah. <laughs> what a man. Okay, well, thanks so much. And uh, I'll let you know when we publish. Okay, thank you. Very good. Thank you, John. Okay, we'll see you. You can stay in touch with Plutopia at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, look for at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. This is the Plutopia News Network. 20 minutes into the future.